On behalf of CSIS, I would like to welcome you all here today to these panel discussions. It is a special privilege to have five ministers of agriculture here uh, from Mali, Liberia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Mozambique, and that's a rather rare occurrence, so we consider this a special, uh, very special event. And we also have senior officials from the State Department, USAID, and the Partnership to Cut Hunger. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have Peter McPherson here, who will be making some opening uh, comments as well. Uh, my name is Bill Garvelink. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS, a new one. Uh, I've spent most of my career at USAID and the State Department, and most recently I was the first deputy coordinator for development for Feed the Future. My successor is here, Jada McKenna, and I also helped set up the Bureau for Food Security and was the first head of that bureau. So these issues are, are very important to me. I would like to um, make just a couple of comments, and then I will turn it over to Peter McPherson. Uh, I'm sure today will be very interesting uh, and insightful, and I'm sure of that because I had the opportunity to talk to a, a number of the participants last week in Iowa, so I know the discussion is going to be very interesting. Uh, the CADAP process has provided a uh, framework for African countries to develop their agricultural programs and to establish their priorities. And CADAP has also been an avenue for donors to engage in that process and for the United States that's through the Feed the Future initiative. And I think uh, this, this effort has been highly successful and I think we will all look forward to hear the minister's comments about the, SADC, or the CADAP process and the role that donors have played in that particularly Feed the Future. And we're very much interested in uh, the minister's thoughts and recommendations for the future. The public sector, the pub public sector's relationship with the private sector, both the international private sector and the national uh, private sectors of African countries are very important to this process, as we all know, and to the sustainability of what uh, the African countries and the donors together have, have been working on. So another area of interest for the panels today to talk about is the role of the private sector, the linkages with uh, the African governments and the additional linkages that are being thought about in the future. And a final comment is that for many years U.S. land-grant universities have, have worked with ministries of agriculture and with um, African universities to develop a cadre of agricultural specialists and scientists. Unfortunately, that process has waned a bit over the last decade or two as U.S. funding has diminished. Hopefully, one of the things we can talk about in the, in the two panels a bit is the importance of this relationship and how we can revive it and maybe uh, modify the training and education that is being offered to fit the current needs of of the, of the African governments now as they work more closely with the private sector than, than in past years. So those are a couple of, of issues that hopefully uh, will come out during the course of the discussion. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter McPherson. Well, good to see everyone. Uh, my name is Peter McPherson. I'm here in and it, at least to, in one capacity is chair of the board of the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. Uh, it was the partnership with AID and, and USDA resources uh, that was able to, we were extremely pleased to be able to facilitate uh, the five ministers of agriculture being here in this country to the World Food Prize and now here in Washington. We've always felt that it was just critical uh, for those African voices to be heard. In fact, when the partnership was founded uh, 10 years ago, I was then president of Michigan State, and we put this together with some very key people. In, in this country, it was, it was Senator Dole and some others, Lee Hamilton, and then in Africa, a set of presidents, including the then president of 
of uh, Mali, uh, President Conore, and then President of uh, Mozambique, Sassano, uh, were, were critical and involved. Uh, uh, President of Ghana, uh, who, we, who we got a World Food Prize here just this last week, all were involved in putting this program, this partnership together. So uh, we have seen from the beginning that this was important to have African voices and U.S. voices together to make it work. Of course, this this uh, this excellent meeting hosted uh, by CSISC uh, has been uh, is a is a uh, is a situation an opportunity that we've had today and and other times. Joanna was reminding me I'm supposed to be here next Friday as well, another event. Uh, so welcome to everybody for what I think will be an excellent opportunity. Now, as I think about development, I, I'd make a couple points. One, when you look over the history of countries that have made progress and haven't made progress, there's a lesson, in my view, one of the lessons, is that countries who have taken charge of their own country, their own future, uh, have been those most likely to succeed in sustained economic progress. Um, and the countries that we have here today, the ministries from these countries, have each in their own way said, we're going to do this ourselves. We need help, we need advice, but we're going to take charge of our own future. And I think that's just so critical. And I believe uh, the, ec the results uh, that you see uh, in each of these countries, uh, Liberia is, is having its is come out of hard, hard times, uh, and, but it, there's some real progress there. Uh, you can look down the line. So that's lesson one. Development should be country-driven with a broad-based economic and social agenda of a country, in our view. Two, uh, countries make progress uh, if they have some degree of political stability and they have reasonable economic policies. Now, everybody's going to debate about what's reasonable, uh, but there's, in my view, there's no cookie cutter. Uh, what's important, again, is that, that, that those politics and those economic policies and that agenda is country-driven. Now, Africa, of course, through the CATA process, has an Africa uh, approach. And I think this working together and sort of driving these key things together has, in, has, in fact, particularly the last year and a half or so, uh, was picked up steam, has in fact helped drive uh, change and opportunity in so much of the so much of Africa. Well, those are the general concepts. But what are some of the what are some of the specifics? In countries with a large rural population. There's no way not to have food and agriculture be a central agenda. Hence, feed the future. Uh, in addition, it's clear that you need new technology. Feed the future is working on that with you. This will take time. Moreover, you need human resource development and capacity build, develop, uh, building. Bill mentioned some of that. You need the role of the private sector. I think there's some core concepts in all this, and I know that our panel, uh, with lots of experience, will comment on that, and I look forward to hearing those views. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I, I have to say, three or four years ago, it would have been almost unimaginable to have a, such a big group assembled uh, and to 
to think of having five ag ministers here at CSIS was a little bit far out at the time. And so I think the fact that we've got such a fantastic program, such a fantastic audience, indicates the importance that um, food security is taken in our, in our development policy. And I also think uh, the fact that a place like CSIS is working on this issue indicates the importance of food security and ag development as a central part of our overall foreign and security policy. And that's very much um, the spirit in which we try to think about the issue. I want to acknowledge um, very important uh, actors in today's activities, Michelle McNabb, who's the new face of the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa, and Daniel Karanja and the, their whole team who really, we could not have brought the ministers here, so um, we really appreciate them bringing these ministers to us. Um, we have, and we're waiting uh, for Minister Magambe from Tanzania, but we'll go ahead and get started because we have, I think, a great set of discussion uh, points today. What we'll do is we'll spend about one hour in our first panel really talking about CADAP and Feed the Future. Spend about an hour in our second panel talking about the private sector. And then Assistant Secretary of State Jose Fernandez will be with us uh, for sort of some closing remarks. He has been hosting um, some discussions with uh, several ministers on different types of technology and biotechnology and agriculture. We'll close out with some thoughts from him. So with us uh, this morning, or this afternoon, we've got Minister al Hassane from Mali, uh, Minister Chenoweth from, uh, from Liberia. We will have Minister Magembe from Tanzania, and we've got Jada McKenna, who's the new Deputy Coordinator um, of de for Development for Feed the Future. And I think what we've got is a very wide range of experiences and wide range of, um, of situations in each of your countries. Minister Chenoweth said, look, I think everyone really wants to spend time asking questions. So I think that I will not give any more introductory comments, but I'd like to um, have our ministers open with a few comments and then uh, get some reactions. And then I'd like to have Jada sort of follow up with her overall reactions and a response from the U.S. government side and then open for your questions. So um, I think I really have one major overarching theme and one minor theme I'd like to bring up. Um, our overarching theme really is, is that we've made some real progress on food security. The U.S. has stood up this Feed the Future program. Each of your countries has been engaged in um, the CADAP efforts and goals and implementation. And I think today we'd really like to hear about how everything is going in each of your countries and just have you comment on where things stand. My minor question that I'd like to ask you to comment on at some point in our discussion uh, has to do with something that both Peter and Bill raised, which is the future of your, um, your agricultural workforce and your technology. We at CSIS are finishing up a report on U.S.-African cooperation around agriculture science, and we'd be very interested to hear how you're thinking about um, your research, science and education plans for each of your countries. But I think, first of all, let's hear your overall framing remarks. And um, Minister Chenoweth, can we start with you, and then we will turn to you, Minister al Hassani. Okay, thank you very much. You know, when I hear caught up, I just want to, to play our jingle and dance. <laughs> because uh, caught up, is something that we embrace across the continent. For the first time, it is homegrown. It had leadership from our bosses, from our leaders, and it had participation from us as, as agriculturists or, and foresters and others in, in the sector. So we feel that we own it. We also had the enormous task of explaining it to our population in a language that they could understand. So that down to the small farmers, for many of us, we did it the typical African way. We prepared jingles and said everything we wanted to say about Kadap, and people dance and listen to it. And so you can go, small farmers talk about Kadap, and Kadap to them means that all they understand is that CADAP will help to improve their agriculture, and that's good enough for us. <laughs> oh, oh, but another thing I like about it is that it gave us, as a continent, an opportunity to see agriculture and food security, food and nutrition 
security in our country with a broad spectrum of what is happening in South Africa and what is happening in Mali and what's happening in each of our countries that we don't necessarily have to duplicate. The other thing I like is that oh, we now have, oh, because we understand, we help each other. And I can tell you it's like a peer review. Every step of the way in becoming a uh, Kata compact country, because first thing before you could start talking about it, you had to develop your local program and, and make your leader proud that you would, uh, you would become a Kata compact country. Next door to us was our big sister, Ghana. Ghana was beating us at everything. <laughs> you know, we had our country completely destroyed. They were there before. They were never so completely destroyed. They had rebuilt. We were a hippie country, highly indebted, poor country. They were, but they had, they had settled it. And we thought, at least there's that spot number seven. <laughs> so Liberia would try very hard to beat Ghana at number seven, <laughs> getting number seven, and, and we did. <laughs> so we are number seven, Ghana is number eight. <laughs> oh, but now, anyway, we had the program, and on a serious note, we had to come back now, and having put, uh, uh, get up all of the excitement, develop, a program for implementation. That program of implementation had to be so all-inclusive or across the board, make sure they fitted into long range or plan. It was tough, especially when you are head of an agency like uh, mine in Liberia that covers everything from forestry to fisheries to cooperative to whether it's the birds or the rats or the whatever. They, they're part of the things we should pay attention to. Uh, uh, so to get all of that together in a, in a comprehensive program was not easy, especially so that one of our biggest losses in Liberia was in our human capacity. We were working with a, a capacity strength of only 30%, little less than 30% in our agency, but we did. We also took it to the last level of where you enter a global competition to put your package on the table and have it scrutinized by people you didn't even know. And then you stood to win some money. The maximum you could win was $50 million. We won 46.5. Right. We were so, you know, delighted. So now that we have that 46.5, that the program for utilization of that money also has to fit into the CADA uh, plan. It also has to fit into the Feed the Future because we are a nation that have taken ownership, ownership of what uh, we do and what will be our, our destiny. So we make sure that even if it's a program like Feed the Future, we make sure that government has a contribution in it so that we can sustain the benefits of it uh, afterwards. Uh, so that's, that's basically what, what CADA uh, means to us uh, in Liberia. And I must say that it opens some sensitivity across the continent. Everybody knows that we and Sarah Yoon were starting from scratch. So uh, we get a lot of assistance from the region, from the African uh, region in terms of training. Our people, they've opened their doors to our, our students to go to their universities. We cross with research or uh, information using their research institute as we try to rebuild uh, ours. So I think CADAP has done more than just force us to think about agricultural development. It has forced us to think of how to work together as a nation so that we can use the resources internally 
and from outside or, or more efficiently. Lastly, I think because people have seen from the outside investors or that we are planning, we're not guessing, we're taking the time to lay out our frameworks and we're sticking to our plans with weaker rooms. We, even in a new country, because we, we were the oldest country, or we still are on the continent, but we, in terms of independence, but we have six years under our belt of coming back and trying to rebuild. But even in that atmosphere, we have invested $17 billion worth of foreign investment over the past five and a half years. And of that investment, over five billion is in the agricultural sector. That will create in the next nine years, because it's not 10 anymore, 71,000 jobs for our, our country. Uh, I'd like to stop there and leave it with you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you Mitch, you want to come up? <laughs> Minister Al Hassani, we're going to have uh, Mima help translate, if yes, that's okay. Yes. And I think you, your country has uh, some different approaches, and you focused on different types of markets and supply chains. We'd like to hear you comment. And Mima, if you would. Now I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Merci. Je voudrais d'abord remercier mon mon interprète. First of all, thank you to the interpreter. I got a whole new role these last week. A whole new role. Et je pense que il m'a il m'a rendu des grands services. Big service. I have provided a great service. You will owe me one on this one. <laughs> Mais comme je n'ai pas d'argent pour lui payer les frais, je vais lui payer en nectar. Ah, d'accord. Voilà, that's PPP. Since he doesn't have money to pay me, I will be repaid in hectares so and we'll have a proper PPP. Voilà. <laughs> et donc, je, voulais, je remercie également l'assistance, tous ceux qui sont venus en nombre et en qualité, certainement. And thank you very much for everyone attending in, in large numbers and quality. La salle est remplie, ça veut dire que les sujets intéressent les gens. The room is full, so that must be that the, the subject is interesting. Et nous, ça nous fait beaucoup de plaisir, nous Africains. And that gives us much pleasure as, as African participants. Parce que tout simplement, ça veut dire que les autres s'intéressent à ce que nous faisons et à ce que nous sommes. And that means others must be interested in what we're doing and who we are, so that pleases us. <coughs> Je voudrais dire également que L'Afrique doit être fière d'avoir un programme comme ça, un programme détaillé de développement de l'agriculture. So I must say that Africa should be proud to have such a, uh, an extensive and detailed program of uh, agricultural development. Ça veut dire tout simplement qu'on prend conscience qu'on eh, ne peut pas faire quelque chose individuellement, il faut l'Afrique unie. And what it, it really is demonstrating that we're recognizing we cannot do it alone, we really need a united Africa. Et une Afrique unie, derrière laquelle il y a le monde, certainement nous allons avancer. And uh, that's, you know, behind the sort of United Africa, we have been able to advance things. Et comme, uh, je ne sais pas si c'est les Américains ou les Anglais qui le disent, ils disent, what man did man can do. Wait, wait uh, pardon. Donc, ah. <laughs> you tricked me there. Donc, uh, nous sommes des hommes, donc nous pouvons faire ce que les autres ont fait. Ah. So as the Americans or the, uh, the Brits say, as we are, we are people, we can do what people can do. Il pour nous de it just has to do with us getting down to working. Pour ce qui est, uh, du PDDA au Mali, du CADAP. And uh, what is all about the PPDA? C'est un processus que nous avons commencé pendant que nous avons déjà engagé un processus au niveau national. So this, uh, the whole process is really now developing at a national level with the CADAP. Et au Mali, il a été un processus très inclusif et très participatif. So in Mali, the process was very inclusive and very participative. Avec tous les démembrements de, 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 des acteurs publics, privés et de la société civile. With all actors participating, public, private and civil society. Et sont associés les partenaires au développement. And that are associated as, as partners in development. Et c'est pour cela que nous avons également voulu que ça soit fait de la base au sommet. And this is why we wanted to be sure that it was covered from top to bottom. Et c'est pour cela que ça nous a pris un peu de temps. 
which is why it took us a little bit of time. Et le, 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 la, suite, la, la suite de ça, nous avons signé un pacte, le, le pacte qu'on appelle ECOAP CADEP. And we have then at the end of that signed the ECOAP uh, uh, compact. Et, et ce pacte-là, il a été signé par le ministre de, de l'intégration africaine pour dire que nous sommes dans l'Afrique. And that pact was signed by the Minister of Integration at the AU level. Le ministre de l'Agriculture. The Minister of Agriculture. Le commissaire à la sécurité de la à l'agriculture de la CDAO. Uh, the Commissioner of Agriculture at the uh, ECOWAS. Les représentants des partenaires au développement. The uh, representatives of development partners. Les représentants des collectivités territoriales. Representatives of the uh, territorial uh, collectivities. Les le représentants de la société civile. And representatives of civil society. Et donc, euh, tous ces acteurs doivent être associés à l'élaboration et doivent être informés des différentes étapes. So, all of these actors need to be well informed of the decisions made through each of the steps. Euh, nous avons aujourd'hui euh, fait presque approuver les tout parce que nous avons présenté notre plan d'investissement prioritaire à la réunion de Dakar en 2010. So, we presented our uh, investment plan to, uh, within the CADAP uh, uh, compact in Dakar in uh, 2010, Et December il a été, 2010. has been reviewed and uh, amended il a été à, à la CDAO and transmitted to ECOWAS pour être à, uh, au GAFS. So there would be submitted. So it would then be submitted to all the various partners. Donc nous avons espoir que tous les temps que nous avons perdu pour élaborer un bon document, nous allons les rattraper en gagnant beaucoup d'argent. So all of the extra time taken to develop this uh, this uh, elaborate plan now will be made up by being able to attract and invest a lot of uh, money into the country. Et il n'y aura pas de classement entre nous, euh, les Libéria et les Ghana. <coughs> il s'agit pour chacun de nous d'être performant. So there's not going to be a ranking between us and Liberia. It's just a matter of both, of, all of us being uh, performing. Et la CDAO nous a déjà retourné <coughs> les rapports de sa, de sa revue. And this, uh, the ECOWAS has now already come back with their commentary. Et nous sommes en ce moment en négociation avec la Banque africaine de développement. Sur la formulation d'un programme d'aménagement de l'irrigation pour la production d'iris. And we're now in discussion with the African Development Bank, in fact, into a major project for irrigation of rice. Parce que tout simplement, l'iris est en train de devenir la première céréale de consommation en Afrique de l'Ouest. And why rice? Because rice, in fact, is becoming the very single largest growing uh, cereal consumed in West Africa. Certainement pas parce que il est c'est la céréale la plus riche, mais C'est la, la céréale la plus esthétique. Et chaque Africain veut manger les riz le, 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 le jour. So it's, it's not so much that it's necessarily the esthétique, the, 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 the best or the healthier, but it's, it is the one that is most cherished by the consumer. Et à propos de, de, de je voudrais ajouter également que à propos des aménagements, à propos de de, 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 de nouvelles technologies, euh, il y a de grands besoins. As concerns the uh, land preparations and, and, and new technologies to be utilized, there are many, many needs. Aujourd'hui, le Mali est excédentaire pour la production de céréales. Uh, today, Mali is a, uh, a, a, produces cereals in uh, excess in their own requirements. Mais malgré tout, il arrive des périodes où nous avons des manques. But we still run the periods where we have shortages. Parce que quand nous produisons, nous n'avons pas d'infrastructure de stockage. Because when we produce, we do not have the proper infrastructure for uh, post-harvest storage. Aujourd'hui, le Mali est excédentaire pour les céréales, mais il y a de la, un taux de malnutrition élevé. So even though Mali is uh, producing more than they require, there's still a, uh, a malnutrition, a certain level of malnutrition in the population. Un taux de malnutrition élevé, tout simplement parce que les céréales qui sont produites ne sont pas transformées et rendues à la population sous forme d'aliments faciles à, à digérer et riches. 
and this is particularly the case because the cereals that are produced are not necessarily processed in such fashion to be consumed well easily and to be uh, nutritionally balanced. Je voudrais dire que dans ce domaine de la transformation, les femmes sont pour le moment les plus actives. I must say in this uh, area of, of uh, processing value-added, the uh, women are the most uh, active. Elles sont déjà dans les petites et moyennes entreprises. They're already in the small and medium-sized enterprises. Mais il y a une nouvelle, euh, une nouvelle industrie également qui naît. But there's also a new industry being born. Et c'est pour cela que j'ai j'ai fait appel ce matin à tous ceux qui veulent investir qu'il y a à faire au Mali dans yeah. le domaine de la transformation, de l'agroalimentaire, de l'agribusiness. And which is why, as I did this morning, I, I appeal to all those wish, wishing and interested in coming into investments in any value-added agro-processing agro-business. Les gens peuvent travailler, peuvent venir investir dans la production, dans la transformation, et puis dans les, la commercialisation. People are welcome to come invest in the production, in the transformation, and in the commercialization. Et le taux de, de croissance du Mali cette année est autour de 5%. The uh, growth rate of Mali is around 5%. Et grâce à l'agriculture. And that's primarily thanks to agriculture. Et donc, uh, <coughs> malgré que nous avons dépassé l'objectif de Maputo, nous sommes à 13% aujourd'hui du budget national pour l'agriculture, je demande toujours au ministre des Finances de faire mieux pour l'agriculture parce que c'est elle qui lui permet de bien parler à la Banque mondiale. So even though we've already surpassed the Maputo uh, uh, agreements of uh, in that we're investing 13% agriculture, I'm always uh, pressing the Minister of Finance to do yet more for agriculture because that's where the growth is. Et chaque fois que je viens aux États-Unis, j'ai envie de parler de la mangue du Mali. And every time I come to the U.S., I have the, the will, the wish to speak about the Mali and mango. Parce que il y a quelque chose qui me fait mal. There's something that bothers me. Quand, quand les Américains vont à Bamako, ils adorent manger la mangue du Mali, mais ils ne veulent pas la faire venir ici. When Americans come to Bamako, they absolutely love the taste of the mango, but they don't allow it to come into the U.S. Et donc, vraiment, j'encourage également que dans le cas de la Goa, que l'on puisse faire que la mangue du Mali soit vers les so I really, really encourage that in, in, in line with the Goa that the sector of mango can be developed for export to the U.S. Je vais prendre la permission avec ma collègue de Liberia pour dire que la mangue du Mali c'est la plus délicieuse du monde. Je vous remercie. <laughs> so I'll take my colleague here from Liberia to still say that in the end the mango from Mali is the, the absolute best tasting in the world. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thanks to our translator and to Minister Alassani. So, okay, we're going to move now to Jada McKenna. Jada, we'd like to just kind of get your response and then also uh, hear your thoughts for, for what's coming up as we look forward. Uh, thank you very much to CS. Oops. Thank you very much. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Um, thank you to CSIS for hosting this and to the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa and to all of you here and especially um, to the ministers on the panel. I'm very honored to represent the U.S. government here on this panel and, and to speak on this as your partner. Um, and we are very excited to, to be your partners in, in this endeavor um, because all of you are focused countries and we're very excited about it. Um, as all of you know, Feed the Future is the U.S. government's um, global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, and I, I know you've heard of it a lot today um, and also in the past week, but I wanted to start there because, um, you know, our commitment of three and a half billion dollars over three and a half years is, is a small part of a total uh, commitment that was made by the G8 at L'Aquila, and I was very excited to hear both Ministers Alassane and Chenoweth um, speak about the multi-donor trust fund that's part of that initiative, um, GAFS, but so over 10 percent of our own U.S initiative went is, uh, has been committed to funding GASP and in this way it's really exceeded our expectations in a lot of ways and it's, it's an integral part of our bilateral funding. Um, the principles of Feed the Future that Feed the Future relies on are, are country ownership, 
um, accountability as well as multi-sector and multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, and, and what we've seen in GASP as well as our bilateral efforts really highlights that. The, the great thing about GASP was it really um, it provided incentives to a lot of countries to hurry up and complete their kind of <laughs> investment plans. Um, and, and, and kind of in that rush, we still were able to get um, great quality and, and really worked hard to get consultation across all the sectors as, as you talked about because, you know, at the end of the day, we know the only thing that works is really country ownership of these projects and, and as development actors, our goals are to work ourselves out of jobs <laughs> and, and, and the way that, to that sustainable, inclusive economic growth will be through that country ownership and through that multi-sector approach that really incorporates um, the, the civil society, the farmers themselves, as well as, as countries. Um, at the end of the day, as we've implemented Feed the Future, um, the important thing to note about the CADIP investment plans is that they are not just documents for donors to get donor funding, and, and both ministers really touched on that. I mean, they are meant to be investment blueprints for both private investment and public investment, and we've been really thrilled to see that as we've implemented and worked with our country partners um, to, to develop our own bilateral programming that people are thinking about both sides and there are processes um, Tanzania, I know Minister Mugambe, Mugambe, if he were here today, he would, if, when he does come, <laughs> um, he will talk about SAGCOT and that really um, innovative public-private collaboration. Um, the World Economic Forum really provided the platform for SAGCOT to expand, and from there, actually, SAG WEF has now partnered with CADIP, <laughs> which just shows you how important CADIP is, to look at how to replicate that process of countries looking at their investment plans and decide and picking places where they are inviting the private sector, both local and international and other public sector companies, to, to come in and work with them to develop impact at scale. Um, in implementing our own bilateral funding, we have really chosen to pursue, uh, to pursue a path that will get to that development impact at scale. So we have worked with countries to identify certain value chains and regions where we will focus our funding to really demonstrate to people that this works. And when actors come together, so when we partner with the countries and the World Bank and other donors, and we really put our minds and, and our money <laughs> and our energy towards specific specific areas, you will see success at scale, and, and we're excited to be starting that process, and, and, and some countries are further along than others. Um, as a U.S. government, our, we particularly feel like our strengths lie in um, research and development innovation, and I know we are um, working with all of you and with your national research institutes, as well as with um, the U.S. university community and other actors to bring improved technologies uh, to bear in this effort. Um, the other focus for our programming really is on the empowerment of women. Um, which you, two, you both have spoken of as well. Um, and one thing that we're excited about is a, a Women's Empowerment and Agriculture Index that we are developing with Oxfam and with IFPRI. And we're piloting it. And what we'll do is in the zones of influence, so you know, in where we're working with in countries, we will look to see how women have been empowered and, and their um, influence over assets and, and access to the benefits of our programming and other pro donor programming in those areas. So we're very excited. Hopefully that will provide another ranking mechanism, <laughs> another way for you guys to aim to beat Ghana <laughs> and, uh, and others. So, so we're looking forward to seeing that. Um, and we've also really been focused on nutrition and, and looking at the decreasing undernutrition and, and working to weave that into the CADAP agricultural development plans, particularly focused on, on children um, in that kind of thousand day window. So it, it's been, we've learned quite a bit. Um, the country ownership dimensions have taken off in, in ways that I don't think even we foresaw, which has really been a, a credit to all of the governments and in, in moving forward aggressively. I mean, Mali for Mali to, to talk about 13% of its budget to, to even exceed the CADAP commitment is, is truly a remarkable and an, an example that we hope um, that others will follow. So. Uh, thank you for having me, and I'll, I'll stop there so we can get questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Jaden. I have a note that um, that Minister Mugembe had to go to the airport to catch uh, his flight, so we won't see him today. But we've got plenty to talk about, and some of the other things that I didn't mention early on, but uh, that have come up include the question of nutrition and how do you improve nutrition as part of an ag development approach, which I think is it's a challenge. It's difficult, but there is a lot of opportunity, but it's going to be one of the difficult nuts to crack. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Um, I want to uh, honor, honor Minister Chenoweth's um, mandate that we take questions, as many questions, because I know a lot of you are curious. If I could bundle two or three questions at a time, please wait for a microphone. I'll call on you, then state your name and your affiliation and your question. Make it short so we can take as many as possible. Who, who wants to go first? Okay, in the back here, we'll get a microphone over to you. I would very much like to hear uh, both of the ministers comment on what you just said, that is how you link uh, nutritional goals with agricultural development. Your name and affiliation? Uh, Chris Goldthwaite. I'm a member of the partnership and I'm also a consultant here in town. Okay. Uh, okay, how do you link uh, nutrition is the first question. Another question we can take? Uh, David. Thank you. My name is David Hansen. I'm with the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities. Um, my question has more to do with the CADAP process, the formation of the CADAP compacts and now implementation. And it really has to do with the role of higher education, research, and technology development in the process. Uh, it's my understanding that the CADAP compacts were done primarily with ministries of agriculture. And higher agricultural education rests with ministries of education. Therefore, uh, in talking with some of my colleagues from African higher education institutions, they feel like perhaps they've been sidelined in this process of formu formulation of CADAP compacts. And I was just wondering uh, your perspective on this as well as implementation of the compacts now and how higher agricultural education might play a more formative role in the process. Okay, Mima, could you translate the question for Minister Alsani? Hi, Charlotte Hebebrand from uh, the uh, International Food and Agricultural Trade Policy Council. Together with the partnership, we um, looked at AGOA, and I wanted to come back to uh, uh, Minister Al Hassani's comments about the mangoes from Mali. I confess to only having eaten mangoes in Burkina Faso, and they were delicious. Uh, I look forward to eating Mali's mangoes as well. Um, could you, one of the conclusions we reached when we looked at the rather disappointing impact AGOA has had on increasing African agricultural exports to the U.S. was in fact in this realm of standards. So would you mind just in a non-technical way giving us a sense of where is the problem? Why, why is it so hard to get uh, uh, mangoes from Mali here in, in the U.S.? Just to explain a little bit, how long have you been trying to, to get an import approval? What are the hindrances on your side in Mali, and what may be some of the hindrances here with the with the U.S. government? Thank you. Quels sont les problèmes que vous avez eu pour en faire exporter les mangues maliennes, les obstacles que vous avez encourus, et même ils voient qu'avec le programme d'Agoa actuellement, c'est très limité les produits qui viennent par Agoa. What's your opinion? Okay, so we have uh, trade and phytosanitary guidelines, we have higher education, and we have nutrition. That should give us something to start with. Who would like to start with? Okay, let me start with the coordination. Oh, the oh. <laughs> Ministry of Agriculture in Liberia led 
or the process. It was the hub for the Qatar formulation. But we have to, under our new mandate, we have to work inter-ministerial collaboration. And it depends on what the subject is. Anything we do in agriculture, we involve, we work with Ministry of Planning, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Youth and Sport. 65% of our population is age zero to 35. We have to work with Youth and Sports. Ministry of Health, because as you know, an agricultural problem can quickly become a health problem. Ministry of, of Public Works, because as we're trying to rebuild the country, we uh, work with public works on every new road that goes in so that there is some farm to market road. We do not let them get away with calling it feeder road. A feeder road is one thing, a farm to market road is another. So we work very closely uh, with them. Now on the higher education in, in Liberia is not even Ministry of Education. There is an a, a, a institute for higher education that we work with, but the universities, the institutions are always a part of, of these uh, plans. Then after we've gone through with the, the private sector uh, and, and our development partners, uh, as my colleague has said, after we've gone through that, we cannot take that document anywhere except it comes to the full cabinet and have cabinet understanding and, and endorsement. And then we, we also take it to our legislature not to get their endorsement. We don't want to get into that can of worms. We, but, but we have to go and educate them on what the process is so that when it's time for the budget, they will not see it as a strange animal. So uh, we are together uh, on, on that. It's not, it's not held only with the Ministry of Agriculture. Do you want to mention nutrition? Yeah. Agriculture? Now, with the, with the uh, nutrition issue, uh, uh, you know, from the 70s, I have been on this band worker of talking about food. <laughs> from that World Food Conference in 1973, about talking about food and se food security and leaving out nutrition. When you leave out nutrition, you have what you have in, our sit in the situations in most countries. Nutrition does not have a home. Is it in Ministry of Health? Is it in Ministry of Our Where is it? If you look at the, the, the legislature putting agencies together, nutrition is all over the place. I am delighted that finally we are beginning to talk about food and nutrition. And so our CADA uh, program did take uh, that into consideration. For example, we've made one, we have a serious nutrition problem, as you can imagine. We, we have completely changed the growing of sweet potatoes, which is cheap, easy to reach, good nutrition, from growing of the white sweet potato to growing of the red, fleshy sweet potatoes. Farmers have accepted that so well. Mothers are to my delight putting one of those in their children's hand, and better still, giving them a little bag of peanuts with it. So we've tried to push the nutrition uh, message. We don't have uh, that much expertise. We've gone back and hired retired people that are putting together the message, but we do have people in, uh, in training. So as much as we can, we try to uh, integrated nutrition. Right now, our second staple is I heard my colleague who is not a rice eater. I am. And I think rice is delicious and nutritious. But uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we are good friends. <laughs> Go after it. We, we uh, are also looking our second, at our second staple, which is cassava, which as you know is mainly energy. We are now part of a program with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, which is next door to us, uh, on experimenting with the nutrition-infused cassava. For us, 
our job will be getting people to eat yellow cassava, yellow looking cassava instead of white. We hope that we will not have the case of the golden rice. So we are beginning to talk about uh, it now. Anything that we introduce that changes people's tastes and preference or forces them to eat something, encourage them to eat something that they are not used to, we try to push the education along with it and get mothers especially uh, to understand the messages. Yeah. especially talk about the mangoes. Okay. <laughs> Not especially mangoes. <laughs> je, je vais pa parler également des questions de nutrition et de formation. I would like also to uh, say for mangoes speak about nutrition and nutrition. I would like also to be sure to speak not just about mangoes but about the impact of nutrition and the aspect, the questions asked non, about uh, higher education. Je vais prendre la, la permission avec une autre modératrice pour cela. Les, les domaines de nutrition euh, chez nous sont gérés par le ministère de la Santé. So for us, the issues of nutrition are managed by the Ministry of Health. Mais il constitue des préoccupations euh, majeures pour le gouvernement. But it is a major issue for the government as well. Le ministère de l'Agriculture est chargé de produire. <coughs> Minister of Agriculture is charged with the production. Et il y a après des politiques de transformation des, des produits agricoles pour donner eh, des aliments eh, de qualité eh, aux populations, notamment aux enfants et aux femmes. After that, there's the whole uh, policy of, of um, imbuing the, the nutritional aspect into the foods that are produced, particularly for the children and the, and the women. Mais particulièrement l'accent sur les, 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 les nouveaux-nés, les petits enfants et les femmes enceintes, mais aussi les écoles, les so, écoliers. Particular emphasis then is put on uh, uh, pregnant women, expecting women, uh, children, and in the um, school age children. And in the cadre de la formation, bon, ça rentre un peu avec la formation. <coughs> le gouvernement a adopté une politique nationale de l'alimentation scolaire. So in, in this in this uh, in this whole scheme of nutrition, government has taken up a national plan of a school feeding program. Et <coughs> c est, c est, cette politique a pour avantage de maintenir les enfants à l'école, de, de pouvoir les faire manger pour qu'ils restent à l'école et qu'ils étudient. Ça, c'est dans le milieu rural généralement. Et cette politique a aussi un grand avantage de faire en sorte que les enfants restent à l'école plus longtemps, particulièrement dans les zones rurales. Et comme euh, souvent certains de nos génies nous viennent du milieu rural, donc euh, cela est extrêmement important pour que ces enfants soient éduqués. So, if, given that you know so much of our children are coming out of the rural areas, it's important that this this program be maintained to keep the kids in school in the rural areas. Et le, 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 ce, ce, ce qu'on fait aujourd'hui, c'est que nous travaillons avec les PAM dans le cadre de la fourniture des cantines scolaires. So we're working today very closely with the World Food Program in, in the school feeding programs. Il y a quelque chose de très intéressant au Mali, c'est que dans le passé, les PAM achetaient du maïs américain pour donner aux écoles. And something very interesting is happening in Mali. In the past, the uh, um, World Food Program used to buy uh, American made corn for the school feeding programs. Mais depuis trois ans, les PAM achètent au Mali la, les farines et les semoules de maïs pour donner aux écoles. Donc la production nationale transformée au Mali. Donc, but in the last, since the last three years now, World Food Program is is purchasing locally made, locally processed maize for the school feeding program. Et moi, je suis très heureux parce que j'ai <coughs> été alimenté à la cantine scolaire avec des produits venus d'ailleurs, mais aujourd'hui, c'est des produits de chez nous qu'on donne aux enfants. So I'm very happy to say that when I now visit the school, schools and the, uh, the cafeterias, those cafeterias are now supplying food that is locally processed, maize that is locally processed. À propos de la formation supérieure, <coughs> As concerns uh, higher education, uh, nous avons un institut d'économie rurale qui a qui forme des qui qui qui, qui reçoit des chercheurs. Uh, we have an institute of rural economy that actually receives uh, the uh, researchers. Et on a un institut de supérieur de formation uh, uh, professionnelle agricole qui fournit les qui forme les chercheurs. And there's a, 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 a superior institute for agricultural Donc, training oui. where People are trained that go into the room. Au niveau de l'institut de l'institut de, de, de 
où il y a les chercheurs, des, des recherches agricoles aujourd'hui, nous avons 250 environ chercheurs. So in this institute, we have approximately 200 researchers. C'est moins qu'un brapa au Brésil, mais c'est quand même quelque chose. It's a little, a little bit less than the number of researchers in Embrapa in Brazil, but still a good effort on our part. Et je pense qu'il y a quelque chose d'intéressant aussi parce que tous nos chercheurs, nous avons des coopérations avec les universités américaines pour perfectionner les formations. So what's interesting is that with all of the research program, there's a tight collaboration, close collaboration with American universities in that training program. Dans des domaines très précis uh, concernant, par exemple, la résistance des plantes, aux sécheresses, aux attaques des nuisibles, etc., etc. And especially in certain specific areas such as the insect-resistant plants and, and other drought-resistant plants. Et pour ce qui concerne les, les problèmes de l'exportation de la mangue, c'est une, une question difficile à remplir, à, a, disons, à répondre. C'est une question question à répondre. La première fois que j'étais venu <coughs> aux États-Unis dans l'avion, quand j'ai rempli les documents concernant les, les, les aliments que vous portez avec vous, j'ai failli euh, retourner. Avant d'arriver, parce que j'avais un colis, je pensais que j'allais être expulsé à cause de ça. Tellement la, c est, c est, c est, il y a des restrictions pour ce qui concerne l'importation des, des aliments aux États-Unis. So the first time I came to the U.S., in fact, with a suitcase full of uh, Malian mangoes, I, I almost was expelled because it's very tight restrictions on fresh, pro fresh produce. Mais je voudrais quand même remercier les, les secrétaires à l'agriculture parce que nous sommes en concertation en ce moment pour Ils nous ont remis des documents pour voir quelles sont les conditions qu'il faut remplir. Je sais que c'est difficile, mais peut-être un jour on y parviendra. So we still must thank the uh, Secretary of Agriculture and his people because we are now collaborating to see how we could actually meet the requirement, the phytosanitary requirements to bring the mangoes here. Non, c'est un peu seulement pour jouer mon amitié avec les Américains que j'ai dit ça. It's only to, to, to make a little bit of a joke about Americans that I say that. Parce que déjà nous exportons la mangue vers l'Europe. Because we are already exporting quite a bit of mango to Europe. Et nous avons aussi les marchés africains. And we have also the African market. Et la campagne dernière nous avons exporté 11 000 tonnes de mangue. So the last season we exported 11 000 tonnes of mango. Dont 5 000 vers l'Europe. 5 000 towards Europe. Et 6 000 à l'intérieur de l'Afrique. And 6 000 inside African Donc continent. Donc à l'intérieur de l'Afrique même, il y a un marché bon, qu'on n'a pas fini d'explorer. So there's quite a market regionally in, in the African continent we haven't yet fully explored. Mais je voudrais que la manga malienne aille encore plus loin, qu'elle traverse like l'océan. But we'd like to see the African manga, or the Malian manga go even further and cross the ocean. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. All right, I think we have time for just uh, one more round of questions. Uh, right here in the front, and then we'll go to the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Walton, and I don't represent anyone but myself. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the question I would like to pose is that, you know, given the fact that some 80% of the farmers in Africa, especially the small farmers, are women. They do most of the work to get the crop out. What specifically have you put forward in your countries in terms of policy and processes? One, to assure that women, rural women, many of whom have yet to learn how to read and write, have their rights protected in terms of controlling the revenues from the crops they produce? And secondly, what's being done to encourage women to become professional agricultural advisors so that they can work with this majority of farmers uh, uh, at the local level? Si je peux traduire la question pour... Merci absolument. Pour son excellence. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre, uh, la question que j'ai posée est qu'est-ce que donner que, que quelques 80 personnes de tous les fermateurs d'Afrique de, sont des femmes, surtout les petits uh, agri, uh, cultivateurs. 
qu'est-ce que vous faites chez vous dans le domaine de politique et, euh, et des actions pour assurer que les droits de ces femmes sont bien protégés concernant le profit qui, et le revenu qu'ils gagnent de, de leurs efforts. Et, et deuxièmement, qu'est-ce qu qu'on fait pour encourager plus de femmes pour bien étudier et devenir des animatrices professionnelles dans le domaine de l'agriculture, puis bien travailler côte à côte avec ces, ces cultivateurs féminines. Merci. Okay. Tu viens me remplacer. <laughs> and then the last question we'll take from Philip Thomas in the back. Hi, my name is Phil Thomas. I'm an employee of the Government Accountability Office here in Washington. We do a lot of work on food aid and food security. And in 2008, we critiqued the global food security situation. And uh, we were highly critical of, you know, donors, the U.S. government, African countries, NGOs, just not really doing enough in terms of food security. And we looked at CADAP, and I believe CADAP, you say, was established in 2003. There had been very little progress in terms of meeting the goals and objectives of CADAP. And many people criticize CADAP as just being uh, a talking forum, you know, and that there was no real action to support uh, its, uh, the framework. And now there seems to be a shift and there's an attempt to uh, make it a much more substantive effort with more on the ground activity. And I was wondering if you could describe what has happened and why. Donc, si je peux traduire en vitesse, donc en 2008, euh, monsieur avec le gouvernement américain, il y a eu toute une analyse du de, de pro, programme de CADEP et les, la critique des donateurs dans cette euh, formation de, de CADEP. Et en 2008, le CADEP était plus mot que action, plus parole que action. Et il voit que dès euh, les, les dernières années, euh, depuis 2010, disons, qu'il y a plus de, de, de mouvements vers des actions. Donc de votre perception, qu'est-ce qu qu'il y a là qui, qui transforme plus euh, vers une euh, positive transformation de CADEP What, what are we doing for women? You are right, 70, 80% of those are in production or involved in producing food or in the agricultural sector or are women. And first and foremost, women at all stages or the female are targeted for education because if you look at any of our statistic, you will see that the figures are not balanced, whereas our population is almost 50-50. It's, all, it's always so many boys and one third or even less or, or girls. The girl child is a target point for or our investment across the board. We also are encouraging the girl child uh, to go to higher education because of the scholarships, scholarships uh, for me in the agricultural sector, which is the one ministry that has uh, targeted uh, uh, scholarships. As I told you, we will have 71,000 jobs. We need to train people to take off, up those jobs. So you study agriculture, you, you, you get a scholarship or if you, need, if you need it, but we do have, I do have a bias or to make sure that every, every one of those young ladies uh, get a scholarship. The next thing uh, is that when this government took over, we started to rebuild six years ago, our children had not gone to school for 16, 17, 18 years because there were no schools going on. So we, we in building the education uh, sector again, we put in two things for the younger, uh, for the youth and below, and the very young children, the, for the youth especially, the rapid education. I don't understand it, but it works. You take a 16 year old and they go into the classroom for the first time 
And I can tell you the transformation is like day and night. God bless whoever put together those rapid education system. It works. But we also have it for women, for women farmers, or for, women, for rural women, or the other education programs. So tied to the farmers' field school that teach them how to use, how uh, to use their hands and, and, and in the field. There are also evening classes for other education. And you have to be in an audience and see a rural woman that used to sign her name with dipping her thumb in an indelible ink and announcing proudly, showing her little book, because they have these little books that they, booklets that they use, saying very proudly, I can spell my name. I can write my name. And they will not let you go away until they take a piece of chalk or paper and write their name and stand up and spell it. So they are, are getting some, uh, some form of, of education themselves. And then, as I said, as the uh, farmer field school. In terms of input, uh, I, I told the group earlier, that the World Food Program is feeding children in 1,400 schools across our country right now with locally produced uh, 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 products. But uh, most of it comes from women. And, and the Liberian women are not or the typical women that we know of that take that money and then the men take it from them, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Before and now, they were an economic power, and they know how to hide their money and how to <laughs> invest it. And one of the one of the things that we do when we buy produce or we, uh, from these women through the Purchase for Progress, the under the WFP or the government owns program, we pay them cash. Because we work with the banks to so take the, the cash, you receive the product, you pay them cash. So that nobody's saying you have to stay home and mind your baby and send the men to collect the money. They receive their money at their, 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 farm, their farm gate. You ask about the food aid. Most cases now, food brought in is monetized and the money is used to support agricultural development, local agricultural development. And that's an arrangement that is made uh, uh, with many of the people who uh, support us, us in, in that way. Um, so we have this oh, land tenure. Finally, after 164 years of independence, we are going there. We are dealing with our land tenure issue. We have a lands commission that is looking, or uh, I mean that that is working with all of us on uh, going through the nuts of the land tenure issue, and and it's a long process, as you know. It was not built uh, in a day, but but it will look at land tenure issue. You see, in Liberia, the inheritance law gives equal right to men and women, to boys and girls. We don't have a disparity. So we have that benefit on our books. And land for farming is not given to the man for the woman, no. Even traditional land, you can you could be a woman and you will get traditional land. So if you divorce or your husband dies, the land is not taken from you. So at least we have where that of that bit or ahead in it. So the land tenure issue, I think, will, find, will be that final niche where people can have a piece of paper to the land that they, they farm and be able to make better judgment on a better decision about what they grow and what they do with their land. Women, you put the money in their hands and you can be sure their children will eat and they will go to school. Merci. C'est des questions très intéressantes. Very interesting questions. 
Very interesting questions. Les, les droits des femmes. The right of women. Uh, parce que je pense que <coughs> Madame a parlé des des de droits coutumiers, des traditions en Afrique, qui sont des qui ont des survivances très fortes. So Madame a spoken of the customary law of, uh, for women in Africa, the tradition law, which is very strong. Et moi, je parle sous le contrôle de l'ambassadeur du Mali, M. Traoré, qui est là. And I'll speak under the, the control of the U.S. or the Malian ambassador of the U.S. Il y a certains groupes ethniques de chez nous dans les villages. On ne <coughs> donne pas la, la femme a, la, a le droit d'exploiter la terre, mais on ne lui donne pas la propriété. But there are certain ethnic groups in Mali where the women have the right to to work the land, but Parce do not necessarily have the legal right to the land. Dans le, dans le, dans les coutumes, c'est l'homme qui perpétue l'héritage de la famille. Because in the traditional customs, it's the, it's the, it's the male lineage, it's the man that, that carries forward the patrimony of the family. Et donc à l'époque, nos rois, quand ils ont réfléchi, ils ont dit, bon, quand on donne la propriété de la terre à la femme, il suffit que quelqu'un qui vient d'un autre pays vienne l'épouser pour que cette terre aille à ce, ce pays-là. Donc so, ça peut créer des conflits. So historically, under the monarchy at that point in time, if land were to go through the female lineage, someone coming from outside, could be acquiring the land and creating conflicts. Donc c'est pas, c'est pas, je, je dirais que ce n'est pas, c'est pas une intelligence. So that would say, ce n'est pas une intelligence. It's, it's not necessarily not unintelligent. It's not necessarily unintelligent. Peut-être que ce n'est pas adapté aujourd'hui. Maybe it's not adapted to today's reality. Et donc dans le cas du Mali, pour adapter tout ça, nous avons reconnu les droits coutumiers. Le droit qui est un droit d'usage sur la terre. So for Mali, then we have accepted the traditional law, the law of the utilization of land, use of land. Mais il y a l'autre droit, le, le, comment on l'appelle ça, le, le droit moderne qui dit que la terre appartient à l'État. And there's also now the modern law, which actually states that the land belongs to the state. Et ce que nous faisons pour donner aux femmes des avantages, c'est que le président a pris un texte pour dire que tous les aménagements qui sont faits par l'État, 10% reviennent aux femmes automatiquement. Donc, so what, what the government has done through a, a presidential decree was to assure that of all the land the government has, at least 10% does go back to women. Ça, c'est les aménagements faits par l'État. That's for, for developments, land improvements that the government puts Parce forward. Parce que l'État ne gère pas en régie chez nous. Quand l'État aménage, il donne aux populations. Because government, in fact, while might invest in, in improving land, it doesn't actually manage it. It goes back to the community. So to assure it is why the 10%. Donc the les femmes ont droit à 10% de toutes les terres aménagées. Hence, women have a minimum right of at least 10% of all the land that is improved. Ça, c'est en plus de leur droit d'acquérir de la terre en tant que eh, chef de foyer, chef de famille. That's over and beyond their right as head of family to be able to acquire land. Il y a une mesure comme ça qui concerne 5% des terres en faveur des jeunes. Uh, des quoi? Des jeunes? Des jeunes. Yeah. And there's a similar kind of law there that favors uh, up to 5% of the land being passed through to, to youth. Aujourd'hui, il y a une politique de formation qui encourage les femmes également à, à progresser. So today we have a, a, a national policy to really encourage women to... To advance. Il y a des quotas pour les cabinets ministériels, There's pour les nominations dans les, dans les, 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 les hauts postes de l'État. So there's, uh, there's quotas established for the, the number of ministers that must be women, as well as for the recruitment advancement into the higher civil service. Et il, le gouvernement également accorde des bourses d'excellence <coughs> aux filles qui passent leur baccalauréat, euh, qui... qui, 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 qui Okay. And governments also have uh, allocated specific stipends for girls that pass their uh, their diploma, high school diplomas. Bon, et puis aujourd'hui, la femme malienne est une femme vraiment qui, qui est très active dans la vie, quoi. So really, today we find that the Malian woman is very active in, in the working day world. Nous avons une femme premier ministre. We have a, our prime minister is a lady. Nous avons une femme secrétaire générale du gouvernement. The Secretary General of Government is a lady. Nous avons plusieurs femmes dans le Parlement. The number of women that are. À peu près 11%. 11% of the women in Parliament in the, are in, in the Congress are women. 
nous avons, euh, nous avons, euh, comment je vais dire ça, des femmes dans tous les cabinets. Nous avons des femmes mères aussi des communes. So we have uh, women in, in all the various ministries as well as the political posts as mayors of towns. Et au niveau de l'économie aujourd'hui, elles sont en passe de se mettre devant les hommes. And in fact, today in the in the working day world in the economy, they're advancing the head of Dans les affaires privées de commerce et de Certainly in commerce uh, and in, in business side. Pour ce qui concerne même l'agriculture, la première les premiers les premiers les premiers dans le domaine des de semences, c'est une femme. So even if you look at the the seed, the commercialization, I think of the, the seeds, it's actually a, a, a elle une, women enterprise. Elle a une coopérative qui s'appelle Faso Kaba. The cooperative called Faso Kaba. Faso Kaba, ça veut dire le maïs national, c'est ça, non? It's the the national maize brand. Et elle a fourni cette année 300 tonnes de semences de Nerica, le nouveau riz pour l'Afrique, au Sénégal. And this, this year she supplied 300 tons of Nerica, the new uh, ri African rice, into Senegal. Elle a fourni 80 tonnes de semences de maïs améliorées également, hybrides. As well as uh, 80 tons of, of improved maize yeah. rice. Et elle a beaucoup d'agro-dealers dans les pays qui vendent ces semences. And she has many agro-dealers and in fact are reported to her. La plupart d'eux c'est des hommes. Most of whom happen to be men working for her. Donc uh, aujourd'hui nous sommes dans une situation où c'est les femmes qui emploient les hommes au Mali. So today we're in a situation where we actually have the women employing the men. Voilà, je pense ce que je voulais donner comme réponse. So and that is a response. Merci. And not to mention you're completely outnumbered on this panel. Et vous êtes le seul homme sur cette autre table. Well, I think we're a little. Vingt-cinq pour cent. We're a little over time here, but Jada, I wanted to give you a chance to just uh, offer any closing remarks before we close. No, the, the one thing I would add is that what we're seeing in some countries is the setting up of implementation units or separate bodies because so many of these issues cross, minist cross ministries and are, are so much rich, richer than, than just agriculture. And we have encouraged that where they've propped up, we have been active in helping to set them up and encourage those. So um, as other countries think to that, we're happy to share knowledge and, and help through Feed the Future with that. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our panel. And we'll invite the next panel up uh, right away.
Can we please take a seat? Grab your drinks and we'll start up, please. Good afternoon. I guess between being translator and moderator, I don't get lunch or drink, so if I get irritable, you'll know why. So please sit down. <laughs> If I can introduce this uh, panel, I'm Mima Nedeljkovic. In my spare time when I don't translate, I get to be partner of the Schaefer Group in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm also a board member of the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. And have been for a long time now, and have been very, very much uh, keen on getting more and more of our African partners from the private sector involved with this discussion. Hence, you will see on the, uh, on the board here, uh, I mean on this panel, uh, Jack Kahn from the private sector. Um, Schaefer, my group, has been doing agro-industry, I think we're getting damn near 50 years now, all over the continent. Um, we have been, we're Louisiana-based company, so very strong in sugar cane, rice, aquaculture, and then all of the cogeneration from power coming out of biomass, any form of agro-industrial waste uh, is where we think is going to make both sense for power production as well as improving the efficiencies and profitability of agriculture. I am also, in the sense of full disclosure here, a very, very strong proponent of public-private partnerships and have been for a decade before the, the terminology became sexy. Agro-industry is very difficult to formulate public-private partnerships. Uh, much easier in power sector where you have the independent power producer and then government picking it up in terms of the transmission. Uh, but for agriculture, every case is difficult, different. It is difficult, but it is for us or for me, certainly, the answer to the future, and why I'm happy to, to, to uh, moderate this panel, it is where the large and the small meet. It is where, where the public and the private interests meet. It is where, really, in the end, I think we're going to find the answer to, to the, the additional productivity to feed the future, feed everybody on the continent, and, in fact, be an exporting continent of food. So those are my, my introductory comments. Uh, as you know, we will be focusing specifically on building strong and sustainable public-private sector partnerships. We have on the panel with me uh, Minister of, uh, I think you have the bio, so I'll skip the, the detailed introductions, but Minister of Agriculture from Mozambique, Mr. Pacheco, Minister of Agriculture from Kenya, Minister uh, Koske, and then my colleague on the board, Mr. Jack Khan, who is the CEO of Novell Group. What I would like to do is ask each of you, if you will, those from the public sector, from your perspective, Jack, from yours on the private sector, as to what is it really that governments could do more to really incentivize these sort of PPPs. Uh, frankly, in some of the interviews and investigation done as a partnership, We've also seen, Jack, that from our own side, from the private sector side, we're often missing the boat. And I think it's critical that we really dive into how these sort of partnerships and common interests actually make the whole discussion of land grab, frankly, a null discussion, a void, really an irrelevant void discussion in the end if we really get down to all sides of interest being met. Uh, so within that formulation, if I could maybe give each of you, uh, I think we're one short, so we'd say five minutes each, just in terms of introductory comments or perspectives. I have then a couple of specific questions, and then we open up to the floor as we did previously. Thank you. Mr. Minister from uh, Mozambique, Mr. Pacheco, please. Absolutely. And uh, sorry, I believe uh, we've also been joined now by uh, Assistant Secretary Fernandez, is that correct? 
And I, I do, I was waiting to, that he be here. I want to be sure also to thank uh, State Department and USDA in support of all of the activities that in fact the partnership, our various partners and sponsors here have done both in Des Moines, Iowa, last week, the World Food Prize, as well as here in follow-up today. So thank you and welcome. You will be coming forward after the panel. Please. Dear Minister. participant, ladies and gentlemen, all the protocol observed, uh, good afternoon. Mozambique, uh, briefly, it's a count on southern uh, region Africa uh, with the size of 800,000 square kilometers, 21.8 million people, you know, with an arable land of 36 million hectares. We are only using 10% of it. We have uh, 3 million hectares with the potential for irrigation, and again, we are just using 10% of it. Uh, the growth rate of Mozambique is 9% uh, in average. Uh, the agriculture sector contributes to, to the GDP with 24%. Uh, Mozambique right now, we are self-sufficiency in maize and cassava. We are uh, in progress towards self-sufficiency in rice and may and pulses uh, these are uh, staple food of mozambique we do export uh, banana cashew nut cotton sugar timber and uh, sesame it's in progress in protein provision restocking of beef progressive uh, import substitu sub sub substitu substitutions in poultry meat and eggs uh, extraction and proce progressive processing of hardwood, native timber, both for local use and export, together with the commercial plantation of uh, exotic forests. This uh, uh, is happened since 1992, since Mozambique uh, reached a peace agreement. In 1993, Mozambique, it was a country of food aid. Uh, as uh, agriculturalist, I believe we have a moral responsibility to feed people around the world. And young generation have a very Im important responsibility uh, to play important role. Uh, to develop agriculture, we have a 10-year agriculture development strategy that lies in four pillars, research and extension, infrastructure and equipment, market and information, uh, institutional uh, 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 development for public sector reform, for private, uh, public-private sector partnership, together with education. This, the investment set up in place is that right now the Mozambican governor is contributing with 10.6% for uh, the budget, but the target is 10%. We do have a district development fund, agriculture development fund, youth development fund, and other arrangement, uh, domestic arrangement made on microfinance and savings. Uh, and Millennium Challenge account is there. And I believe that Feed for Future have a great uh, uh, window to participate on this investment plan arrangement. If we come to the promotion of public and private uh, sector partnership, what I would like to share with you is that uh, in Mozambique, uh, the private uh, uh, sector, uh, uh, the, the PP, a, a, a triple P, we have a Mozambican Investment Promotion Center. We do to facilitate uh, all the procedure for the private sector to do the investment. We have a private sector council uh, uh, at national level, and in each province, we have a 10 province, there are uh, provincial councils. This council 
uh, private sector council, it meets once a year. In that meeting, the head of state, uh, President of Republic, is there uh, to, chair, to share, and all the cabinet members are there, uh, NGOs and uh, government organization or other partners, they take place to report on what is the environment uh, uh, in Mozambique on private investment, what is missing, and uh, to identify and share views about the uh, uh, to improve the uh, in, uh, private environment, investment environment. In agriculture sector, we have agriculture promotion and support center. So if you come to invest in agriculture, this unit is there to assist you on uh, where to invest, how to invest. Uh, due to this uh, ra uh, 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 on, on the land issue, what I can say that in Mozambique, uh, land invest, uh, when you come to invest in Mozambique in agriculture, land and investment proposal should be uh, um, in place. Uh, the land process, the access to land is on leasing base up to 50 years. But if investment is done, the land is yours. You can sell investment, you can transfer rights uh, on a heritage uh, basis uh, 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 if the investment is done. The leasing for 50 years, but if you implement the plans, the lands, we say it's yours. On the process of getting access to land, a consultancy will be needed with the local community to make part of all the project. There is a th there are three levels of decision of the land. The level number one is the provincial governors uh, that can apply land up to 1,000 hectares. The ministry, Minister of Agriculture of Mozambique, right now it's me, yesterday some, it was somebody else and tomorrow never know, <laughs> he can apply up to 10,000 hectares. Uh, more than 10,000 hectares should be uh, uh, the, the, the cabinet, the council of the ministry. When you invest in Mozambique, you have tax-free facility and tax holiday up to five years. There is always room to negotiate for a few years more, but not more than 10 years. Um, uh, you can transfer capital if you invest. If there is a room to transfer capital. Um, you can employ a foreigner on your investment up to 10%, but if you employ less, there's a room to negotiate to get more tax facility exemption uh, if you use local uh, labor. Um, come to invest in Mozambique. If you are looking for projects, I can share uh, some of the projects available to invest. Seed industry. Seed and industry is an area we are looking for uh, investment. Um, on the research side, there is also rooms uh, if you are uh, interest, interested on doing and developing research. Irrigation scheme, schemes for different uh, crops. Biotechnology is in needed. We, are, we start operating with some institutions and thanks to Jose Fernandez, uh, is here. We have already had some meetings in Iowa to see wha how far we can go with the biotechnology to Mozambique. And I thank you. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Mr. Koske, uh, Kenya was strong in private sector agriculture when it was still a dirty word in many places in Africa. Can we hear your perspective now going forward as others are catching up? Please. Thank you. Thank you for starting there because Kenya is by and large different from our neighbors from the point of view of uh, private investment in agriculture. In fact, one could almost say that agriculture in Kenya is largely private. Even on a small scale basis, it is private. Uh, if you take the example of tea, because we often talk of the tea production in Kenya because we are a leading pro producer. When it started in Kenya, it was a multinational crop 
from Brookbond and others, 60% of the producers now are small scale and it has worked extremely well. This is the same for coffee and the other crops. Where uh, it is not often understood is in the area of food production itself. Here again, we have people who have 6,000 acres of land uh, where they produce food, but we also have the half acre ones uh, who are also producing food. The challenge, of course, for the small scale farmers, uh, despite I'll not go over the cut up uh, arrangement because my colleague from Mozambique has covered all of us adequately. What we have tried to do as a government there is to ensure that we, ha we have secure food production by providing seed, uh, which we produce 80% of in the country. We still are in seed production as government because we feel that this is where we need to be sure that we can control the process. We are not in marketing, and I don't know how many of you from a small scale uh, basis have tried to market crops. I was thoroughly amused this morning when the World Food Program representative told us that he was brought up in Manhattan. So some of these things we talk about are quite alien, but now I was impressed by his knowledge. So let me tell you very briefly about my experience in the marketplace. No one should ever persuade you to take a ship to the market because it just lies down and won't move. I had the experience of selling chicken. For some reason, you'd run around the building, catch the chicken at night. The following morning, as a small child, you have forgotten to feed it. You get it to the market, and it falls asleep. And every buyer thinks that this one is sick. They don't buy it. <laughs> now, if it is a perishable, like a vegetable, or a big banana, you've carried it to the market. Somehow, if you don't sell it, you have no use for it. Taking it back, if it is a banana, will ensure that you get home with a bent neck and what nobody will have use for it. So this is still a problem for a lot of the rural areas. Uh, in Kenya, you will find that, because we live in the Horn of Africa, that in the last few months, we have experienced starvation in some parts of the country while food is rotting in the other side, again because of logistics and the marketing. This is to be uh, a logistics uh, person is sometimes more profitable, I think often more profitable than actually being the grower. So here is an area where people can actually invest in. If you are coming into Kenya as an investor in agriculture, you shouldn't worry at all because there is already a very vibrant Kenyan and foreign uh, private sector involvement in, uh, in our agriculture. I will actually uh, tell you what we are trying to do as a government in terms of food is that we are, because of the, the, the weather conditions, we are being dragged back into the business of agriculture when in fact it has been rolling along perfectly as a as private sector. And this is in attempting to ensure that we have enough food. Last year, we didn't have enough maize and Kenyans have this idea that they have to eat maize meal and they will tell you, they'll swear, that this is our traditional food. Maize actually came to Kenya in 1917, so I don't know when it became our food, but it is the thing that threatens to overthrow the government every time there is a problem with the weather in the northeastern. Now, we are even feeding the people in northeastern Kenya on maize and telling them that this is their traditional food. It wasn't so even 30 years ago. Nevertheless, we as a government have decided that we cannot now rely on the private sector only for maize because last year we harvested a lot of maize. It disappeared across the borders because we do not actually restrict movement of products. And in the middle of everything, I think one has almost forgotten that there is a country over here called Southern Sudan and their production base is not yet strong enough. And this is the market for the Kenyan buyer, farmer who is private and therefore free to move his food wherever he wants. So we are trying to use the Tana Delta to grow food with, pri with private sector partnership, which we can at least ensure that we are able to sell internally to areas which do not have food. Agriculture in Kenya is profitable. The problem is, what is it we can do to encourage more people to do profit, profitable agriculture other than giving them fertilizer and, uh, and seed? 
one of the problems we discovered was that there is very little uh, borrowing in the private sector, especially private sector. Here, especially private small-scale agriculture, here we are working with the local banks, the high street banks, to actually train people to lend money to the agricultural sector. It sounds very straightforward, it sounds easy, it isn't. 16 years ago, I walked to a bank to borrow money for agriculture. They looked at me and said, are you crazy? Then they gave me somebody to write a feasibility study for me. He wanted 4 million shillings. And I said, I, I went to school. If I had this amount of money, I really don't need to farm. So I had to sit up <laughs> and write one myself. Then I got somebody who understood figures better than I did to put it together for me at 3,000 Kenya shillings. Those of you who know 3,000 shillings can't buy you a meal in Kenya these days. Nevertheless, I was able to access the money. Now, who else, how many women are going to be able to do that? It is very difficult. And one of the difficulties we realized had to do with collateral because our land... Uh, got into such speculation that it was no longer possible to use land because people gave you land as collateral, then they went ahead and defaulted. There was nothing you could do about that. We are trying to work really hard with the private sector to restore that confidence. One of the problems we know in agriculture, especially with the livestock, is to do with insurance. Uh, now, that is again an area where we are working with the private sector in Kenya, and certainly anyone else is welcome to do so. If you think of investing in agriculture in Kenya, here is where you do not have such serious problems with do you have uh, the human resource trained? Yes, we have them. I've listened to the debates this morning about the relationship between agriculture and the universities, and the, I suppose for us in Kenya, the technical schools. Before I came to this job, happily, I was in the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Technology. And this is where we developed the, our biosafety uh, bill, which I took to Parliament within the first six months I was in that uh, cabinet. And it was essentially a draft from the universities and our technical schools. We are trying to build more of those. It went to Parliament and became law. So we have a law. Now, the hard part started because, unfortunately, now I ended up in agriculture. Now I have to implement this thing. And <laughs> this time, it is a question of advocacy because there is such resistance because it all got wrapped up with people's businesses of em importing maize. And if you are importing and you are ahead of me, then I'll go out and say, you know, that is GMO. You are all going to die from it. It's coming from America. Nobody has died in America out of eating uh, anything like that. The other day, uh, I, was, I had a real serious problem with somebody who found out that we were getting potato seed from Holland. And they said to me, are you sure we are not going to die from this? And I said, have you looked at the Dutch? Those people are so healthy. If we could look like them, I think we would be safe. But it's a question of people's interests and also... So Kenya is in this difficult situation where there is private sector, understood, well-practiced, a lot of people are involved. Then there is small scale, it works. But at the same time, three-eighths of Kenya, if not more, is arid and semi-arid. And this, again, differentiates Kenya from the other countries which have been represented here. In fact, reminds me of a book I read in the 60s or 70s called The West and the Rest of Us. When you are in Kenya, you are thinking of the northeastern, north and northeastern, and the rest of us, or if you like, the rest of us and they, because these are different terrains, different environments, different uh, countries affected by different issues. Just when I left, or just before I left, the North is still starving. Parts of Kenya are suffering from droughts. And in that area of the Northeastern, of course, famine kills you, kills you very slowly, kills many people. When the floods come, they kill all of you in one day. So we have, we have this balance that we are trying to do. What are we doing there as a government? We are involved, actually, in growing food with the help of the population there, get several families together, they are doing very well. Our complication is that while our friends around the country are very enthusiastic and they are helping us, 
what they are doing is that setting up their own villages where they will practice this agriculture. But the question we have to ask collectively is, how is this sustainable? Is this going to happen? Are you going to allow anybody who comes in as an NGO to plant this year and be absent next year? That mm -hmm. is going to be very difficult. And this is where we ask our partners and our friends uh, to, to work with us to see that Minister. perhaps we move forward. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. We'll come back. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. We'll weave that issue right back in. Uh, Jack Khan, you're a CEO of Novell Commodities. Uh, many years of trading. Maybe you tell us what the company's about and why you're getting into production and what you'd like to see from governments. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Novell is typically one of these companies moving from a trading activity into a production. In two words, we have a turnover of about a billion dollars in three commodities, rice, sugar, and cocoa, in Africa. As an African, I have really been shocked by this food crisis in 2008, seeing suddenly prices rocketing. And based really on the ignition for me was really that ban on exports of a number of commodities, including rice, out of a few countries, in 2008 and really this has accelerated the volatility of the prices that we still suffer today i mean we've been seeing rice price going from four hundred dollars to a thousand dollars in a period of a year within a year the impact for mrs minister agriculture in liberia was a bag of a rice going from twenty dollars typically to fifty dollars or more knowing what is the minimum wage in Liberia. You can imagine the consequences. Suddenly, we've been seeing all the head of states becoming traders, calling their counterpart, help us, help us. We're about to go to self-sufficiency, but we're not there yet. Let me give you just two, three examples in terms of imports. Liberia is importing 200,000 tons of rice per year for 120,000 to $120 million yearly. Senegal is importing more than a half a billion dollar of rice. Nigeria, more than two billion, two million tons of rice yearly are imported. So it comes to the question for me, how can rice be produced in the middle of Vietnam, transported all the way down to the port of Ho Chi Minh, put on a vessel, transported around the world, coming to West Africa, discharged in the port of Abidjan, then moved all the way to Bobo Dioulasso, and this rice still is cheaper and is preferred by the local popul population. There's a problem there. There's a problem. I would like that just, and, and I think the, the, the rice is, is rather a good example. The Minister of Agriculture, the Honorable Minister, earlier said how important rice is to a number of countries in Africa. I believe that Today, there is, I mean, and, and I see really that the tone has been changing over the last two, three years. Uh, and in that, Feed the Future initiative has been very instrumental in, for the public awareness, for all the stakeholders' awareness of what could be done differently. I'm really a private sector guy, and I'm really, we're engaging ourselves in a number of investments in Africa. And basically, how I'm seeing it really is that all the stakeholders have to have a common interest to have to make it happen. All the stakeholders. The first stakeholder are the communities, the local communities. At the household level, being the women, the children, they have to be part of this global new agriculture for Africa. They have to be part of it. We would never have seen the chaos that we have seen in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, if the communities were owning something. You do not destroy what belongs to you. When you don't have anything, then you go ahead and you destroy everything. And basically, this is, has happened in a number of countries. The second point is really the involvement of the government, I insist, and the local authorities, being the parliamentary or the traditional chiefs. They, they have that, that, that common interest, and, and you've been seeing, I think, over the last week, the, the quality of our leaders, especially our ministers of agriculture, how much they know and how much they care. I mean, the, 
about, about this, this, this new movement that has to happen in Africa. The, the government have, should be really putting the frame in order to encourage these this, this major projects to happen, going, going toward this self-sufficiency, the transfer technology, really putting the frame to make it happen. Uh, to, to make sure that we, we avoid these huge land grabs that have, in a way, advantages in some cases, but most of the cases are not done in a proper way that do not take into the account the, the, the importance of the welfare of the communities. The DFIs, the donors, they want to support, I mean, and the NGOs doing a fantastic job, but how to make sure that everybody aligns the interest for this project. Now, the last point is really the private sector, the last party to that. I really consider that the private sector has to be the leading on this initiative. Uh, and, and seeing it in the US, which is really the, the land of the private sector, I mean, in terms of agri, you, there are fantastic groups here, like the, the Cargills, the ADM, I mean, very successful enterprises. That, uh, and, 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 and really, I believe that it is around this private sector that has the interest to make it happen. The private sector is investing because they believe that they will make money. There's no harm in making money. Uh, the, 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 the private sector will be investing in Africa if they believe that there is a security for the investment. And this will be based on a good governance and transparency. Uh, and that private sector also, both local or international, will have the appetite to go and invest in Africa if they control also the, the marketing of it, and an honorable minister said it earlier, uh, it, it's very important to be able to market what you produce. Uh, so, the, I, I think things are happening, I mean, today, everywhere you go, you hear Africa, Next Frontiers, the success of Brazil, we're going to see it happening over the next years in Africa. And it will be the one who will benefit are really the, the, the groups that will understand that and really place themselves now in Africa. There are fantastic opportunities. If I take the case of Mozambique today with, with the, the water issues that we know are happening in the Middle East. Middle East will come first to East Africa. But I think that Middle East will get the commodities being rice, maize, once East Africa has met fully their self-sufficiency, then the breadbasket is enough for the rice to move then into the middle. So they have fantastic allies. So I'm very optimistic that things can happen, but just to conclude, I would say that the model really is large scale combined with outgrowers and putting in the central of it to make sure that the local communities can benefit another part of it large-scale outgrowers. And I think now, the, 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 and my last, last conclusion, if I may, is, is really why I believe that uh, the, the, the U.S. who has always had that leadership on, uh, on, 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 on agri uh, can, can, can really should be the one, I mean, still heading that, uh, that, that initiative and the, the, I think what is just missing today is to, to really define the various frames on the interactions between the large scale and the community. If we have met that and really have put a nice frame, clear, comprehensive with all parties defining how should be the interaction between the large scale and the smallholders, then we'll get there and it's going to happen. Thank you, Thank Jack. You. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we should have about 20 minutes for questions. I have so many, but I think what I'd rather do, I'll take them from the floor and I'll intersperse mine going through. They're just the one thing as a question being asked if, if panelists would think through in responding that really has come out of the sort of research we've done in the partnership, and that is, I keep calling this the sort of vision thing. You know, if, if the governments, the, the investors, the civil society, and the donors 
all look and say, you know, what are the cards we're holding in hand? What is the comparative advantages these various places have? And let's maximize that value with a way that includes the people all in there, as Jacques was saying, the community otherwise. So if we can just keep that in the back of our minds, I'll take questions. Uh, Stephen, let me take a couple, go ahead and uh, announce who you are and what the question is. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade, two really shorty, quicky ones, which I hope everybody else follows the example. Uh, one, at the end of the morning session, somebody asked a question about agriculture in Agoa. And I would like to be very specific to say the one thing you can do in Agoa to help Africa is get rid of the tariff rate quotas or get duty-free treatment for the three or four products that are excluded. I'm looking at the Minister of Agriculture for Mozambique, of course, and there's tobacco, groundnuts, very small sugar quotas, maybe we can make them a little bit bigger along the way and so on. You add a little sweetener or a little milk to a cocoa, you suddenly lose that value. So that's just one question for attention. Second, again, really quick, continental. Yes, the U.S. is a continental market. That's one reason why we're very successful. There is a lot of movement going on in Africa in order to get regional communities. The tripartite group in the east and ECOWAS in the rest. And if they can get where they want to go, with two or three exceptions, we really will have two important areas. I'm curious, again, in the agricultural minister's view, whether or not they view regional integration as important, or do they say, no, we have to do it nationally first, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, there was a question back there. I think that hand was up. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, my name is Peter Wamboga Mugire from Uganda. I'm a journalist, but also a policy advocate in the NGO world. I'm part of a 14-member uh, group of African journalists, policy makers or government officials, and community leaders who have been training at o Oklahoma State University <coughs> as food security fellows. fellows. And we are very grateful to the State Department for that opportunity. The members are here from Uganda and Kenya. And from other countries I learn, they are also here from other state universities. My question, Mr. Chairman, is to the ministers. For how long will Africa rely on the whole, the hand whole? Will the handhold help us to get out of the production and productivity levels that our countries require when the population growth rates are so high? When you look at the graphics, you look at the, the demographics, you see the population growing higher than food production. The productivity levels of our land are going down. And when you look at the forecast 50 years to come, the population growth rate is so high. Reliance on the whole and merely on the land without introduction of fertilizer is, is not going to deliver Africa from the food security trap. I believe strongly that we need to, to work together through the public-private partnerships to have this happen. I just want to know if there's any, any plans to see a shift from the handhold to another level. Thank you very much, Clear Mr. Question. Chairman. Thank you. Joshua, and then back then, then I'll take some answers. Joshua Walton again. Uh, my question is for uh, Minister, Minister Koske of Kenya. I, uh, I recall when Kenya was a pioneer in uh, testing out a warehouse receipt system, first in maize, and now apparently in other cereals. Uh, this was a few years ago, and I think it was interrupted because of the food crisis and the government's uh, <clears throat> sense that they had to intervene in maize trading to assure a sufficient supply. But could you give us an update on where things stand in terms of uh, the warehouse receding system there? Because I understand it worked quite well in its infancy. Thank you. A question back there, and then I'll take answers. So we'll come back, and we'll see how much time we have. Thank you. I'm Alex from Kenya. Uh, this can be answered by any member of the panel. I wanted to know, is corruption, impunity, a threat to food security in Africa? If so, to what extent? 
and uh, this is corruption, I'm, I'm asking, be it in government or private sector or collaborative. And um, what's the future? Like, if, if, the, if, if it's a threat to food security, is there a solution? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn to panelists on, on those four questions now. And, you know, and one thing that, that strikes me, certain commonality aside from the, the corruption issue, is on the production is, is, you know, our experience as Schaefer, the 50 years really, and I think it's U.S. experience, agriculture requires size. You have to scale up to be competitive. The question is how do you scale up and still pull in this, the independent small farmers that themselves will be growing? That, I think, is the most critical issue that ties into getting out of the whole age, you know, hand whole age, et cetera. But that's my perspective. Could I go to the Minister Koske first? Thank you. Thank you. Let me answer the question on the whole and uh, fast, because the hand whole, uh is, again, part of what we talk about when we talk about women and, uh, and agriculture. I'm sure the gentleman from Uganda uh, has been up at 6 o'clock in the morning and seen a lot of women uh, digging with this hole. We are very aware of this, and we have tried uh, in Kenya. First of all, fertilizer and seed is not now a big issue. But we have uh, centers of uh, equipment, uh, machinery, which farmers can hire at a uh, low price. They are not yet uh, sufficient, so we have some program which we have nearly concluded with Brazil, and we have been talking to South Korea for a very long time, and anyone who has been listening outside there knows that this is what we are trying to do, to have centers of uh, equipment which farmers do not need to buy, they can hire out and at, with government support, if you like, our way of subsidizing. So we are very sensitive to this. I think our other colleagues may have the same, but this is definitely quite advanced in Kenya. Now, on the case that you asked uh, Walters, you said, directly on uh, warehousing receipt. This is well underway. If it stopped because of government trading, I want to tell you that may, that may have been the response to the famine in 008-009. We have had a famine this year, I think, more severe than before. As you probably know, out of this famine, Kenya has acquired the third largest city called Daadap Refugee Center, larger than Nairobi and Mombasa, or Mombasa. That's our third largest city, That's 600 thousand people originally built for 90,000. What happened this year is that government didn't get involved in trading of maize because you know last time it went terribly bad. We have launched the system. It has been very slow because the farmers themselves didn't, I think again it's a question of advocacy and education. The farmers themselves were suspicious because they want to deliver and be given the money right away. This was not available. So let me just assure you that we are working on it and uh, it's still in progress. It should, we have still a few issues of uh, transforming it. We are not yet there, but we are sensitive and working towards Thank that. Thank you, Mr. Koske. Mr. Pacheco, your perspective? Uh, yes, uh, on the uh, ago issue that uh, Steve mentioned, I fully agree that uh, we do need uh, we do need from uh, the the country more efficient response to the growing capacity of Africa when we are emerging to reach the world food basket on the a variety of product. Uh, the procedure in place right now, in fact, are not easy to to follow and with all uh, uh, the limitations. The issue of how it's a matter of technology. Uh, as my uh, colleague mentioned that, uh, yes, the short uh, hand uh, hoe is there. We are busy on putting animal traction, mechanization, and even some other technology of zero till tillage that can facilitate a lot of what is going. It's a matter of an uh, issue of uh, uh, transition. Some of the results you are, look, you are hearing from uh, uh, back home, uh, they have a lot to do with the, the, the transition we are making to use the new uh, technology. Uh, the corruption uh, issue in Mozambique, we said the corruption is exactly disease because when we were young, it was not something familiar with it. But uh, some disease came from artists there, 
we are fighting the disease, uh, this disease. Uh, so to go out from where it comes from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pacheco. Uh, Jack, how can we in the private sector help get out of this handhole poverty trap and how much of this really is tied up into the scaling up and maybe you can also speak of the regional markets that were asked because as I've said before Nigeria does not need a regional market per se in and of itself is a market everyone else if you really want to scale up you need you really do need the regional market and that includes ability to move product internally so while a goal as Stephen is is great I mean there's wonderful things but I would think I'm going to ask for Minister Pacheco, but if you ask me on the sugar we'll be producing in Mali, you can give us all the quotas you want. The better value is in those internal market inside Yuma. So you're never going to get it anyway. Jack? Okay. Uh, yes, regarding the scaling up, for, for me, the number of products is absolutely essential. Uh, we, we've been seeing, sorry to come again on the example of rice, but I think it's really the one that, that, that is probably the most interesting. Uh, scaling up means being able to attract enough consignment to mill it properly, to have a proper mill. Uh, case of Nigeria, you have a number of mills that are idle in Nigeria, rice mills that are idle. Simply no material is coming there. Why? Because you have to be able to attract the paddy itself. So. Scaling up with a large scale will guarantee the minimum required quantity to be able to mill properly. And then the, the, the idea is to be able to attract and offer good enough terms to the outgrowers for them to be willing either to sell or to use the facility to, to mill and then go themselves directly on the, on the market or through the large scale. So scaling up for me is absolutely crucial. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing all this dialogue, which is very important to, to really assist the household. And I think a number of NGOs have been concentrating mostly on helping the farmers. That it's absolutely important. It has to be done. More can be done. They're doing a fantastic job. But it has to be tied in into a larger value chain. It has to scale up. Why is it not valid for us African? And the, we've seen the business model in Brazil. It's working very well. Maybe there are other issues, but this is the way forward. So I, I, I think I answer your question. I just want to say one small word to the gentleman regarding corruption, just to let you know. I, I'm not a, a, a civil servant, so I can maybe answer in a different way the, the, that, that question. Uh, Yes, there has been, there are different types of corruption. There's the smaller corruption with the civil servant that inside the country is earning $200 a month. He cannot sustain. I mean, he cannot make his family live. So how does he do? So let us not be candid. It exists, it will keep existing. Gradually, as the country will develop, it will reduce. Now, regarding the other type of larger corruption and all this, I, I think what is happening on the continent is absolutely fantastic. I mean, all this transparency, governance, people have access to the media, internet, civil society coming in, the people are more and more accountable. I mean, what the people used to do 10, 15 years ago, and we have these examples of names, is not going to be accepted in the coming years. So whatever you do in the coming years, the people, the international community will come after you and make sure. So I think this is really a fantastic uh, avenue for, for Africa. So I, I just wanted to answer to that question of corruption because Thank it is true that it is something that might be preventing a number of large groups that want to come and invest in agri in Africa because they don't have real transparency saying, okay, that I, how am I going to be sure that I will not be taken down by somebody who wanted a bribe, I'm not giving money, or they drag me into something? So, so I, I, I think I'm very optimistic. It's, 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 we're going on the right way. Thank you, Jack. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I think we could continue this discussion. Um, Minister Pacheco just said one, one comment he wanted to add, but I really will have to close up and turn over to Michelle to introduce our closing uh, speaker. Mr. Pacheco. 
you know this issue of uh, um, uh, again with oh, corruption. Have I could hold an assembly because before I was uh, mini before I was minister of public security, but now I'm the minister of public on food security. So I know very well how the things work. Um, <laughs> The issue of, my colleague rose the issue of uh, feasibility study. You know, the, the government, the banks, they ask for feasibility study when you want to uh, produce food. But they will never ask for the feasibility to study, to develop the world, to start the war. Nobody have accountability of it. Another issue, when there is a disease, you may need to use a tetracycline to have infection. If, if you have shortage of food, you may get infection. But the tetracycline will never work on the body, on the system, if may cycline, meat cycline, egg cycline is not eaten. <laughs> Finally, yesterday, 16th of October, World Food Day, I would like to ask of you to make recognition of uh, having all the things uh, coinciding on with the World Food, uh, World Food Day. Maybe we should clap our hand for that. Thank you. Sixteen of October. Oi! Sixteen of October. Oi! Hunger down. And <laughs> <laughs> not minister. Thank you very much, and all the panelists. We thank you very much. A round of applause, please. So, Michelle, I think I turn over to you to introduce uh, since Secretary. I don't know if it's Jose or Jose. I think you've been uh, taken over to the Jose side. Uh, but I believe it's Jose Fernandez. Thank you very much. I'm Michelle McNabb from the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. And this has been the culmination of an amazing week. I'd, love, I'd like to thank the five ministers of agriculture for joining us in the last week of farm visits and meetings. And I asked the Minister Chenoweth from Liberia today how her weekend was. She said, what weekend? Um, they didn't have much time to rest. They've been working day and night. Um, this is their second event of the day, so thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize the African ambassadors who are here who have worked behind the scenes to make this all possible and to participate fully in the events. Thank you for uh, CSIS for hosting today's venue. Um, I'd especially like to thank the Department of State and USDA for sponsoring the minister's visits and for arranging all the legwork that's happened over the past year to get us to this, this point. So nothing further to say except to introduce Jose Fernandez, Jose Fernandez, our uh, Assistant Secretary of State. He's going to give us some remarks, and then if we have time, hopefully take some questions. Mr. Fernandez. Thank you. Good to be here again. Uh, good to see some, uh, some good familiar faces. Uh, you can call me Jose, Jose. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, just don't call me Mr. Fernandez. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be here. I actually have the... Uh, the distinct honor of cutting short what I thought was a wonderful discussion, and I, uh, I apologize for that. I, I would have gladly yielded my, my time. I thought that was exactly the kind of, of discussion that, uh, that, that we needed to have. Uh, I also would like to thank the Center for Strategic and International Studies for, for this entire event. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to, to be here to provide final remarks uh, on today's discussion. But more importantly than providing final remarks, is really to try and have a continuation of the dialogue that, uh, that we already had uh, started in Iowa with a number of the esteemed colleagues uh, in this room. Uh, we, were th we were together last week at the World Food Prize in Iowa, and uh, it, it, it was the beginning of what I thought a, a wonderful um, uh, give and take with a number of our colleagues that, I, that, that we in the U.S. government would like to continue. In Iowa last week, we saw technology and innovation that allowed a farmer to have an operation that was simultaneously profitable and sustainable, 
And we also learned about existing partnerships between the private sector, NGOs, uh, that allowed crops to be produced specifically to address African needs, crops like uh, biofortified sorghum and improved maize for, for African soils. During the week that, that we spent in Iowa, we, we had a very good roundtable discussion with the farmers and with several ministers. Uh, where we talked about the need to have access to technology to address the 70 percent increase that we've all heard about in food demand to feed an estimated 9 billion people by the year 2050. What's really alarming, at least to me, um, in the, is that the production increase that we need in order to address uh, this demand will require, at least by, by if you listen to some of the critics and some of the experts, will require at least 50 percent of an increase in agricultural investment in developing countries. And this is beyond the, the type of investment that, are, that, are, that you see in individual country budgets and the kind of official development assistance budgets that you've seen around the world. And so this is where I'd like to focus my remarks for the last, uh, for the last couple of minutes, on technology and on investment. You know, there are opportunities to expand and, and develop the use of new technologies that will improve farmer incomes and re result in greater agricultural output. I'm talking about the range of technologies from the development of new drought and pest resistant seeds through biotechnology to simple yet simple uh, innovative techniques. Uh, techniques like hermetically sealed bags that can cut post-harvest losses. And in fact, uh, at the last AGOA meeting in, in Lusaka, we had a session on post-harvest technologies, and I don't think there's enough attention being, being uh, devoted to post-harvest technologies. As you discussed during today's session, to move forward, private sector investment will be needed, will be critical at all levels of agriculture to improve food security, enhance access to markets for the poor, and create broad-based economic growth. But to encourage private sector investment, countries will need, as you've heard in the previous session, Countries will need transparent, predictable, and efficient regulatory systems. They will need plant variety protection and patent protection of seeds. They will need to create an investment climate with policies based on science that will send an unequivocal signal to public and private sectors that governments are committed to leveraging the latest uh, scientific innovations. And so uh, we would urge governments, uh, not just in Africa but around the world, uh, to make this a top priority so that plans to address the challenges outlined in your discussions today can move forward at the speed that Africa needs. Without such systems and without such policies, many African countries will miss out the opportunity that new technologies, technologies like biotechnology, have to offer and as a result will be disadvantaged and non-competitive in crop productivity. For example, 29 countries around the world have allowed, uh, have allowed safe science-based systems for agricultural biotechnology. These are 29 countries in both developed and developing countries. And, and these kinds of developments have allowed um, uh, benefits of about $65 billion in economic gains over the last 15 years around the world. In Africa, we only have three countries that are, that are taking advantage of, of technology. Egypt, Burkina Faso, and South Africa although uh, as a result of the leadership of uh, Madame Koske in Kenya, Kenya is rapidly moving forward. As you work in CADIP and as you build a strategy for stronger public-private partnerships, and I heard a, a lot this morning about that and I agree that that's critically needed, I encourage you to think about investment and ensure policies that promote and, and enable innovation. This will provide a clear path to leveraging investment to encourage public-private partnerships and to the research and products that will help you move forward with all of your plans. And as you do that, uh, I would encourage you to do what, what, was, uh, what we started to do in Iowa, what we've done in other meetings in the past, and that's to raise issues that you see as roadblocks or barriers to furthering investment within your own constituencies. As many of you know in this room, because you've, you've participated, um, uh, in the last year or so, uh, we have been reaching out in our bureau to, uh, to the African Diplomatic Corps in, in Washington through a series of, of three conferences that, conferences that we've had so far in order to connect partners and, and agricultural biotechnology. The first meeting that we had was a, was a government to government meeting on the benefits of biotechnology for African agriculture. The second meeting 
uh, facilitated industry to government discussions to ensure that there were policies in place and that we talked about policies that would, need it, that would be needed in order to encourage investment. At the third meeting, we visited field trials and had frank discussions on the, on the role that NGOs and universities could play in the adoption of biotechnology. Uh, we were very pleased by the results of those meetings. Uh, uh, we were very pleased by the fact that at the first meeting we had maybe 15 to 20 uh, um, uh, ambassadors, and then by the second meeting we had almost twice as many. So I think that just having a dialogue is something that, that we felt was needed and actually would, would help to advance, to advance the ball. And we're going to put a lot more effort uh, to build alliances, to, to reinforce education, and to build connections with the private sector as we go forward. Last week in, in Iowa, in discussions with Secretary Vilsack and, and uh, U.S. Government Deputy Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future, Julie Howard, many of you uh, in, in those meetings expressed an interest in moving ahead with the adoption of agricultural biotechnology. And as I said in Iowa, and as, as we've said in the past, for those interested in moving forward, uh, the State Department stands ready to be a bridge for building partnerships uh, to help in, in what I consider to be the three areas where I believe we can we can actually add some value. Number one, on, on regulatory capacity building. Secondly, on, on trying to talk to, to companies in order to encourage private investment in agriculture in Africa. And thirdly, on public outreach. Uh, we look forward to working together. Uh, uh, this is something that you will see our, our Bureau continue to emphasize as we go forward. And I thank you again for the opportunity to uh, close out the meetings today. Thank you. Assistant Secretary Fernandez has agreed to take a few questions. We have a few minutes left. If anyone would like to ask him a question. Here's one in the center. Just wait for the microphone. Identify yourself, please. Thank you very much. I'm Hassan Abdi from Kenya, a farmer. I wanted to ask the question, the first panel, but uh, I'm happy that you have given me the chance. One area that has not been clearly mentioned on uh, this today's discussion, I don't know in Africa whether you have given uh, an attention to global climate change, how it negates on the program or the project we are talking about. Then the other one is infrastructure. Uh, I happen to come from the opposite side of the coin of uh, my minister's uh, area. As she said rightly, I come from northeast and the most arid, the most asal area. And this is where I'm getting the pinch as far as infrastructure is concerned. The rest she has done us proud. What she has said is what is on ground. And we are embracing biotechnology. But here, I don't know again what you are doing about politics. Whenever food is mentioned, politics is just peeping in. So I don't know whether you are addressing this issue. The other one is, which I felt was very important but not mentioned, is youth integration in the food production, the whole system. In our case, the Minister for Agriculture, whatever she is doing, I feel is being undermined the in the Ministry of Education, even the agriculture subject is almost being faced out from the curriculum. So how do we succeed if the youth that is coming up is not embracing agriculture? How can we effectively talk of food security? The other one is uh, what we call in uh, our area often crops or high value traditional crops when you mentioned about uh, nutrition that is what came to my mind this is the area we can exploit and uh, advance and develop this covers the cassava the uh, sweet potato the all that the, the uh, watermelon and so forth and this can be done under 
uh, irrigation. In the Asal area, I wish I have a request, a special request, that the Asal area, although it is called arid and it has droughts, it, has, it is today it is the flash floods that fl kills. Tomorrow is the drought. The day after is conflict for resources because of the two phenomena I've mentioned. And then the fourth time again is uh, hunger and diseases. So, what can we do? In this area, we have 80% potential for agriculture. What we lack is water. How do we harvest service water? Great, thank you. The, uh, I'm not sure if we have more questions because there were quite a few in that uh, <laughs> intervention um, to choose from, but let me see if there are any other questions before we turn it over. Here's one more question back here and then we'll, we'll let Assistant Secretary Fernandez respond. I am Mike from Uganda. Mr. Minister, I would like to know, uh, to get an explanation on why AGOA is not working well. Thank you for the brief and clear question. <laughs> um, you now have six to respond to. Uh, we'll take one more from Minister Pacheco up here in the front and then we'll let you respond. Um, here, please. Well, um, I forgot to tell you but, but that my uh, language, in official language, is Portuguese. The reason we speak English, we are, we become member of Commonwealth 384, and we are surrounded with English-speaking country. We have no choice, uh, otherwise. <laughs> um, I ask for, to, I have no question. I was not appointed, I was not elected to say what I'm going to say. But on behalf of Afghan group, I'd like to thank the government of the United States of America, on behalf of uh, Honorable Secretary of State uh, Jose Fernandez, to find this opportunity of dialogue, to share view, to share experiences. And this, for sure, it, m it will shorten the distance sometime we have in communication uh, between us. We are full support on finding more room like this taking place today and tomorrow and we are all invited to come to share what with what is happening our back home thank you first of all thank you very much um uh, you, your, your gesture uh, you know this is um uh, agriculture and issues with agriculture and issues of food security are, are critical to, to our administration. And I think the only way we're going to move forward is through dialogue. So if, you, if, you, um, if you've been following what we've been doing at the State Department, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USAID and others, is we, we need a dialogue. We need to be able to talk these issues through. They're political issues, they're scientific issues, uh, they're issues of, of funding. So um, thank you so much for, the, for, that, for that comment. Um, you know, let me, I'll, I'll take the, the harder question first, the Agoa question, uh, perhaps. I, I would disagree with you. I'm sure we can, we, can, we can have a discussion, but I would disagree with you that, that Agoa is not working. Uh, I will agree with you that it's not perfect. I will agree with you that we can improve it. But if you look at the numbers on Agoa, even once you get outside of, of the petroleum imports, uh, those imports from Africa have been growing. And, uh, and, and it's, I think the question for all of us is how do, we <clears throat> how do we improve it? Not so much uh, why isn't it, it, it working. Uh, I'll, on, the, on the previous questions on climate change, uh, I think you, you're, that, that, uh, that point was well taken. You know, one of, the, one of the numbers that isn't discussed a lot when people talk about having to double food production uh, by the year 2050 is that part of the reason we need to do that is that uh, those in the know will tell you that we, we're looking at about 25% less land uh, in the next 30 to 40 years, and a lot of that will be because of climate change. So, so, the, so the climate change problem exacerbates uh, the reason why we're, we're very much behind uh, any efforts to try and improve productivity, try to improve agriculture in Africa. And infrastructure will be critical. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of examples, and if you look at our f uh, uh, Feed the Future initiative, there are plenty of examples out there where production has taken place, has a uh, 
has, has grown in, in parts of, in, in, in a portion of a country, but that food hasn't been able to be transported to another part of the country. And so part of our Feed the Future initiative, part of our food security efforts, are designed to, to improve the, uh, the, uh, the transportation uh, to try and improve the infrastructure. And part of that isn't simply just getting the food from one place to the other, but also creating the infrastructure that's needed in order to have more efficient markets. If a farmer knows um, <clears throat> by, through a phone system, by, by, uh, by a cell phone, that she can get more for her crops in another part of the country, uh, hopefully that will spur trade in that part of the country. So we need to work on infrastructure, and we believe and you, if you read the, the Feed the Future initiative, you, we believe that transportation is a, is a very important part of that. Um, I won't get into the politics. Um, I, uh, uh, on, on youth, the, on, the only thing I will say is that um, uh, getting uh, young people into farming is not simply an issue in, in, in your part of the world. Uh, but I, in Iowa, I was told, for example, that the average age of an, of an Iowan farmer it's 60 years of age. Uh, that has a number of, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is uh, the high cost of land and the fact that it's hard to get started in this kind of a, uh, of a business. So it, um, uh, uh, that's as much as I'll say on youth, but I, I do believe that it's, a, it's an issue that needs to be uh, dealt with when you talk about education uh, in, in, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much for those, for those answers to the questions and, and to everyone for participating. I know many of our ministers have uh, flights today, and uh, so we'll let them go. But, uh, Johanna, I would like to... I'll just uh, want to thank you all for joining us, and thank you so much to our distinguished uh, speakers and panels today. Let you know that um, next Friday, October 28th, CSIS will be hosting a, an anniversary um, commemoration for USAID. We will have uh, Administrator Shaw and four other previous administrators talking about USAID and sort of what its, what its future is going to be. Peter McPherson, Andrew Natsios, Henrietta Four, and um, I'm missing one. Brian Atwood, I think, is going to come in by video as well. So I hope you'll be able to join us, and thank you for coming today.